Kia ora. my name is Melanie Oliver, I'm a curator at Christchurch Art Gallery and today I'm going to share some thoughts on several works by artist Emma Fitz that are in the collection. Sports jacket for Marlowe Moss, anorak for Rowena Cade and bomber jacket for Marilyn Waring, all made in 2014 and part of the same project. Born in Ashburton, Emma Fitz completed a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Painting at the University of Canterbury in 2002 and she received a Master of Fine Art from the Glasgow School of Art in 2010. Based in the UK since 2009, she returned to New Zealand in 2014 as the Olivia Spencer Bauer Awardee. She has participated in exhibitions and residencies nationally and internationally, both as an individual and as part of the collaborations Fitz and Holderness and Victor and Hester. In her work, Emma often looks at the histories of women who made a significant contribution to culture, to art or to politics in the past, but who have over time become less visible. Her interest in these stories is sparked informally through conversation perhaps or reading, various forms of research, and it is thought of in relation to our contemporary moment and concerns. For several years now, Emma has translated these stories into textiles, large fabric hangings that both con convey something of a specific historical moment or person and also evoke a more expansive narrative in relation to art and craft, to modernism and to social history. Emma blends archival, fictional and contemporary material in an attempt to evoke the feelings or the texture associated with people. Some of her earliest fabric hangings came out of research that she undertook for her project as a collaborative journal, Victor and Hester, with fellow artist Amelia Bywater. This looked into the stories of three women, Marlo Moss from the UK, Rowena Cade also from the UK, and a perhaps more familiar name, Marilyn Waring from New Zealand. The project was called What, bracket, was, is happening. Explore, it explored processes of re-documenting, of re-performing and representing. As they described it, the artist said, to potentially set the histories of these women adrift in order to consider our own engagement with the material and to look for ways to address the visibility of these women, strategies of hiding and experiences of exile or exclusion. Victor and Hester both retold these histories and explored the surrounding contexts. Using these as case studies to, to connect several times and places as a network of intersecting concerns, equal parts past and present. The three women at the centre of the project came from different disciplines, art, theatre and politics, and they lived in different times and parts of the world, but they were brought together by Victor and Hester for their shared sense of spirit or feeling, their dedication to a cause, their apparent rebellious nature and gender fluidity. Marlo Moss, who was born Marjorie Moss, in 1889, was a British painter and sculptor, working mainly from the 1920s to the 70s in a constructivist style. Her work is frequently compared to that of Pierre Mondrian. She was initially seen as an imitator, yet more recently she has become to be recognised as a key figure, who was important for contributing to the ideas that Mondrian explored in his work. She had a low-key reputation as a British artist in her lifetime, but her work has subsequently entered several important institutions and received greater critical attention. In around 1919, Moss adopted a masculine appearance and this became a lens through which her work is often discussed. Rowena Cage, who lived from 1893 to 1983, was a maverick woman, known for designing the open-air Minack Theatre and for constructing this with the help of her gardener by carving the stage structure and terraces out of the cliff below her house in Cornwall. This amphitheatre on the edge of the sea is dramatic and impressive, even today. Born over 50 years after Moss and Cade, in 1952, Marilyn Waring is a New Zealand politician, activist, feminist and economist who actively campaigned for human rights and environmental issues. She is a household name in New Zealand, but her contribution to politics and economic theory is really discussed. Though Bridget Williams has recently published Still Counting, an update on her influential book Counting for Nothing, and also her autobiography The Political Years just came out last year, 
It's available online as an ebook from Bridget Williams' website now if you're interested in some extra reading. In bringing together these different contexts, Victor and Hester engage history as a strategy to provide comparative examples for ways of living in the present. As tales and models of creative women from the 20th century that could be relevant now. The very title of the project articulates this approach. What was, in brackets, is happening. Stressing the similarity of contemporary issues to those of another time. Sometimes things haven't changed all that much. Such as the need for women's work to be given equal standing to that of their male counterparts. For a broader understanding of gender stereotypes and how a practice might encompass various interdisciplinary forms. There is a wonderful Tumblr website that co collects together the research for the project, which I'd recommend checking out. What was is happening. On this, the artists stage a hypothetical conversation with Marlo, Rowena and Marilyn through an unusual interview format. There's also a Marilyn Waring documentary that you can watch for free online. Just click the little eye in the top right hand corner of that box and it will come full screen. Questions such as, what did it feel like to be a female artist remaking the, remaking the work of a male artist? And how much of, yourself, much of yourself do you see in the work? Are impossible questions to answer from the archival data that exists. But the artists estimate the thoughts and potential responses that are not documented or visible. And they speculate on these inventing qualitative as opposed to quantitative data. The website therefore creates a dynamic interpretation of history. It is from all this research that Fitz created the textile works, sports jacket for Marlo Moss, anorak for Rowena Cade, and bomber jacket for Marilyn Waring. They were purchased for the Christchurch Art Gallery collection a couple of years ago. These large fabric hangings are each made up of two layers of fabric, a patchwork background of silk scarves that fits salvaged from second-hand stores, sewn together to create a, a large rectangular fabric surface. And over the top of this, there is the shape of a pattern for a garment, a sports jacket, an anorak, or a bomber jacket, respectively. With the pieces cut out of fabric, it's still held together as, held together as one large construction plan. Though they are two-dimensional representations of garments, they convey a sense of their three-dimensional potential. The curves imply shoulders, lengths of arms and scooped collars. It is difficult to discern what the completed jacket might look like, but they are very tactile and it is easy to imagine how they could clothe someone or exist in relation to the body. These works are portraits of sorts. For Marlowe Moss, Fitz used a wool tweed material for its connection to a certain era of English fashion as well as being in the style of a sports jacket, an item that would have been perceived as masculine when worn in the early 20th century. Rowena Cade's anorak includes oilskin, perhaps a reference to her outdoors endeavours. Correspondingly, the bomber jacket for Marilyn Waring is cut from a utilitarian drill cotton, asserting Waring's pragmatic and strident activism, cut to the bomber jacket style of 1980s popular fashion. In choosing to work with clothing, and making the particular garment details obvious through the title of each work, the viewer is encouraged to imagine a jacket that might have been worn by their respective figures and discern something of their character and context from this. However, Fitz's interest in utilising textiles is not mainly his costume. The artistic, social and industrial histories of textiles underpin any reading of these works. As well as textiles providing warmth and protection, as blankets, clothing, and so on. They have also played an important role within architecture as the means by which rooms could be insulated and divided to create privacy. Prior to the 19th century, textiles were an essential part of many domestic spaces. With subsequent developments in architecture, tapestries and textiles became less necessary for practical domestic purposes, and their prevalence decreased. But around a hundred years later, there was a resurgent of textile as decorative. Wall-based and ornamental interior furnishings, as can be seen in the arts and craft movement. And they also often help with um, sound balance. I mean, today we still, we still tend to use textiles for window coverings, for aesthetic reasons as well as practical. 
Emma often uses her large fabric hangings to divide and respond to the exhibition space, hanging on strings from the ceiling or rods that sit off the wall, creating a form of soft architecture to be looked at and, whenever possible, walked around. A further reference point for Emma is the backdrop of 20th century modernism and modernist art criticism in relation to weaving. In particular, the Bauhaus in Weimar that ran from 1919 to 1933 developed a strong weaving department through the involvement of Annie Albers, who sought to theorise this craft as a mode of design. The warp, the vertical threads, and weft, the horizontal threads, the interplay of those is inherently spatial for weaving, with the threads making the design rather than just providing a two-dimensional surface like that of a painting canvas. They intersect in a three-dimensional way. She sa Albers said, Just as it is possible to go from one place to any other, so also, starting from a defined and specialised field, can one arrive at a realisation of ever-extending relationships. Thus tangential subjects come into view. The thoughts, however, can, I believe, be traced back to the event of a thread. For Emma, Alba's weaving theory relates her own use of fabric to part of a discussion on the role that materials can play in an expanded narrative. For her work and that allows these tangential relationships sort of broadens out what her work might be, even though it starts as textile. In addition to the history of weaving and textiles within art and craft history, there is a strong relationship of textiles and garment making to industrialization and modernity. As art historian Ty Smith writes, textile mills established the ground for the capitalist mode of production. A burgeoning trade in the late 19th century Textile manufacture was one of the earliest production lines um, in factories. The labour conditions for textile workers continue to be some of the harshest within global production standards, with low wages, flexible contract and sweatshops, based in developing countries providing the cheap labour to supply commodity products for the consumer demands of late capitalism, our fast fashion desires. The textiles industry is closely related to some of the union and labour movements of the 20th century. Emma's large, colourful fabric hangings could be read as handmade banners or flags in recognition of protest action of some kind, though it is the garment patterns themselves that are a more direct reference to the textiles industry. Across diverse cultures, weaving is used as a storytelling device as suggested by some of the metaphors that we commonly use in language, such as to weave a tail or to tell a yarn. Instead of creating a pictorial image to depict something graphically, weaving can convey its message through the threads used to produce patterns, colours and designs. Perhaps it is no coincidence that the term textile contains text within it, indicating the ability to articulate ideas and stories through thread. The history of textiles is also strongly gendered, both being labelled as a feminine craft and the history of its industrial production, where gender uh, it was often women working in those industries, as well as men, um, but gender plays a strong role in Fitt's work. The selection of Marlowe Moss and Marilyn wearing as subjects to research is important. Their personal biography and gender is highlighted by the use of fabric as a medium through which to tell their stories, and the textile histories described above coexist with the direct references of moss and wearing, enriching and expanding the context and potential understanding of the works. There is also Emma's use of materials that were once fashionable but now obsolete. The background surface of each hanging is made from silk scarves that have been collected at second-hand stores. Patchwork pieced together from these outmoded accessories that are donated in abundance and sold cheaply. If you do find any, do let Emma know though. She's always keen for some extra silk scarves. The sewing patterns over these are another item that's plentiful at op shops. You'll always see the bin full of, um, of garment patterns from all sorts of eras. With fewer people sewing their own clothes in contemporary times, it is neither economically beneficial nor suited to our busy lives. So through the reuse of these scarves and patterns and the construction of her work, 
and it continues to reflect the production and circulation of textiles. The women that Emma has selected for reconsideration and recognition are those that have made a strong contribution to cultural or political life. Emma chosen for their complexity, the social significance of their lives and the context or social fabric in which they lived. She talks about people having a texture themselves, as though perhaps being comparable to the roughness of Hessian or the sheen of polyester. And the material of her work relates directly to the perceived nature of the figures she references. Each of these women played an unconventional role in society. The individual stories of Moss, Kate and Waring are important and treated with respect, yet they are also not the only components of the works. Fitz attempts to reach beyond a simple narrative. Archival documents, documentary photography or moving images would potentially tell their stories more directly. But stepping outside of these traditions to present their stories through textiles and other material with its own complex histories enables Fitz to present other significant aspects and to widen the scope of her project and represent a broader discussion of art, social history and contemporary life. As artist Richard Tuttle connects textiles with the concepts of time, in the mind, he says, in the mind of a master weaver that translates into the work is a definition of time that we're looking for. In this sense, the use of textiles for telling histories puts them into conversation with the present. So hopefully my discussion of these three works today helps you think a little more about your present moment and the role that textiles play and the role of women in society and some of those other aspects. So thanks for listening in and check out more of our collection online. Thanks.